with rote references to conditions 50 years ago. I don't claim to have all the answers, only that we must work harder than ever to find solutions, and that we must never forget to ask what class interest is served by any solution. My observations tonight are not meant to needlessly cast fault on anyone, only to emphasize that the crucial test of our ideas and actions, no matter how high sounding the words, comes in the crucible of popular struggle, especially if that struggle requires confrontation with the very institutions to which you belong or that employ you. That is how it was more than 50 years ago when I first became a young lord. And judging by the widespread youth rebellions across the nation, the Black Lives Matter, immigrant rights, and climate change movements, that is how it will continue to be in the future. Because all the accumulated knowledge and experience of radicals and progressives and revolutionaries mean nothing unless we draw the right lessons, unless they lead us to a freer, more just world, one where the fight against class oppression and empire remains at the center of everything we do. Juan Gonzalez, speaking at the CUNY Graduate Center, that's the City University of New York, his speech, Latinos, Race, and Empire. You can watch the full speech, actually the trilogy of his speeches, all three of his farewell speeches, at democracynow.org. And that does it for today's show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Gesder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warren, Aftarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tamari Astu, Joe John Hamilton, Rabbi Karen, Honey Masood, and Mary Conlon. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. That's Dr. Dejana Figueroa, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes. When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. Tune in 91.3 FM WBNY Mondays 6 p.m. for Mental Health Versus, where Carl Shallahorn mashes up music and mental health in a way you've never heard before. Carl dives into topics such as trauma, depression, and anxiety with compelling guests and captivating music. Mental Health Versus, a show both entertaining and informative. Check out Mental Health Versus Mondays at 6 p.m. on 91.3 FM WBNY. to our new broadcast focused on providing insight into events shaping our national and regional world and examining the facts behind those events and policies that are shaping our world for today and for tomorrow. Join us weekly on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. following Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! program. And, of course, our program is live, so you can call and you can join our discussion. We really hope that you will. Our number here again is 716-878-5104. That's 716 716- 878-5104. We're also here with our uh, live streaming director, our engineer, uh, Willie H. Welcome, Willie. Welcome, everybody, to Living for the People with L. Nathan here. And we're also here with our in-studio audience, our audience of one, <laughs> Norm McCarter. Welcome, Norm. All right, good morning, Mr. Hare. Norm helps us to uh, sort of gather in the, the broad perspective, you know, of the citizens as a whole. And hopefully you all hear what 
all of us are saying, and you contribute to the conversation. You help us to see things from different perspectives. The one thing that we have learned in our lives is that no matter how you understand a fact, the truth is you perceive that fact from where you sit. Right. Everybody else perceives a fact from where they th- they sit. Right. If you want a balanced view of how to how to understand that fact, you need to talk to other people who are sitting in other places, hear how they view the fact, look at how you view the fact, see what the real substance is behind both views, and then come to a reason understanding about what really is going on, what you really need to be reacting to. Uh, I want before I get too far into the program, I want to re- remind us if or inform us that the uh, Concerned Citizens Following the Dream Committee, which is coordinated by uh, Sister Betty, Bessie Patterson, uh, she's been doing this uh, Martin Luther King birthday celebration, uh, I, I think it's 22 years now. She's been doing this for almost forever. And um, the celebration is going to take place a week from Sunday on January 15th. It'll be at the Klein Hands Mu- Music Hall uh, at, um, well, you all know where Klein Hands Music Hall is on Porter, Porter Avenue. Uh, it's going to start at 6, 6 p.m. Uh, it's going to include uh, a whole, I don't know if you know all of these different, you know, folks, but lots of different uh, uh, gospel singers, uh, uh, modern uh, 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 culture singers. What's, what do we work, use for modern culture singers? People that do blues and rhythm and blues and rock and all the different things. I just call that modern culture singing. <laughs> okay, we, But they'll have that. The uh, dancers from the African-American Culture Center. Um, just a whole range of people. They've got uh, uh, a, a list of folks who are going to be receiving awards at this uh, celebration. Uh, and part of the reason why you hear me talking about this Guess who the keynote speaker is going to be on January 15th? Oh, it must be you, Mr. Hill. It must be me. So <laughs> you're going to hear this. I got eight, eight, eight uh, uh, programs that I do between now and, and, and uh, uh, January 15th. Every one of them is going to have a commercial on <laughs> about me being your keynote speaker. So uh, hopefully you'll all join in. Uh, I don't get to talk to many of you face-to-face, so this will be an opportunity for us to interact uh, with each other and to also celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. So hopefully you, you, know, you all will will participate. Some of the people getting awards are uh, people like Bishop uh, Jacqueline Foy. Uh, she's getting the Women of Distinction Award. Uh, Sharon Belton Cotman, who is uh, the president of the uh, Buffalo uh, Public School Board. She's getting the Education Award. Uh, Judge Craig Hanna, you know, who uh, chaired, you know, my former organization, a community action uh, organization, a $53 million not-for-profit, one of the largest not-for-profits in New York State. Uh, I think that's something to be uh, 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 honored for. Uh, Tommy Reed, uh, Reverend, who is now Bishop. Well, I know Tommy Reed. Right, Bishop Tommy Reed now. Uh, he gets the uh, Humanitarian Award. I know you all know Lenny Lane. You know, you know, the uh, Father's the, Program, the fathers, yep. right? Nice. He's getting the Community uh, Award. Uh, uh, Reverend Bishop Robert L. Sanders. Nice. Uh, Refuge Temple, right? right? Uh, he's getting the Interfaith Award. All right. Uh, Jomo Okono, you all know him. You know, he's been a, uh, a strong Africanist uh, leading the Juneteenth uh, uh, celebration, the Kwanzaa celebration every uh-huh. year. Uh, so he's getting the uh, Community Service Award, Oswaldo, excuse me, Diversity Award, Oswaldo Mestre, you know, who's been. Yeah, I know. Uh, a, a, I know Oz, yeah. Right, you know, City Hall. He's nice, a, yeah, he's a good, a, a good brother. Right, you know, he does that uh, uh, community s- uh, service, you know, thing. You know, if you if you have a problem and you can't figure out who yeah. to call, you call Oswaldo, who we call I call. Him Oz. I call him the Ghostbusters, right? Call so, him, I call him Oz. <laughs> you know. You, you you call the, you call Oz the Ghostbuster up, yeah. you know, and say, you know, there's trash that's been piling up in my driveway. Yeah. I don't have any way to get rid of it. Can somebody come and get it? And then yeah, you, good man, I like him. I, but of course, Oz will ask, why do they pick up the trash on Trash Day? And they're gonna say, I don't know. It's been two weeks or three weeks. And then Oz is gonna call the mayor and say, Mayor. People telling me they haven't picked up the trash over here, you know, for two or three weeks. Then the mayor calls up whoever runs the trash department, uh-huh. sanitation, streets and sanitation, and says things we probably can't say on the air. And <laughs> miraculously, trash starts getting picked up. <laughs> so 
It's it's that sort of stuff. So I just wanted you all to know. I think Jerry Dandridge is getting the uh, 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 MLK Businessman Award. Uh-huh. That uh, that's just an important thing. So put it on your calendar. It's a Sunday. Uh, uh, the Super Bowl won't be going on that week. It'll be the. I think the second week of the uh, playoffs. So, no, Mr. Hare, what, what award that. are they giving you, Mr. Hare? I, I just get to speak. Oh, okay, all right. You know, that's, right. that's enough. Yeah, I've that's gotten enough, these right. awards in, 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 in years oh, past. Right, they figured he had enough awards now. There you go. We'll there use him to. Uh, where, where, where is he going to put all of these things? Right, right, <laughs> right. I got you. So um, I want to talk to you all in our public about something that you might find hard to hear, but— I think it's something that you have to hear. If we actually want to grow ourselves into being what we keep claiming is the more perfect union, you can't grow into perfection by adopting imperfection. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, sir. You know, if you want something smooth, you can't put crack stuff into smooth stuff and expect whatever comes out of it to be smooth. It's only going to be less cracked, right? And it may only be less, less crack for a couple of minutes because cracks have a tendency to grow and uh, it, it'll just get worse. What am I talking about? I went to an article written by Harrison Cass. Uh, this is written uh, for MSN.com. He says the biggest threat to America isn't Donald Trump or the MAGA, the Make America uh, Great Again people. Mm. He says that's, that's not the biggest threat to America. Even... The insidious people who have the view that we want America for us and not for them. All the thems have to be others and they have to be second tier Americans. We only want America to work democratically for the us's. Even those people, as insidious as they are, they are not the biggest threat to America, according to Harrison Cash. I want you to follow where he's coming from. He says that. The contemporary discussions about threats to the U.S. democracy make a sweeping assumption that America actually is a democracy. That should, that should raise a question in your mind. Mm-hmm. If America isn't a democracy, well, then what, what is it? So <laughs> he says, he argues that the United States is no longer a democracy. And I'm going to argue for you that the United States was never a democracy. Mm. You're not going to like me when I get done with this conversation, okay? but I need for you to, to hear the perspective that I'm going to be coming from. He says that uh, rather in functional terms, the United States has become something called a plutocracy, a government by the wealthy or of the wealthy, by the wealthy and for the wealthy. I'm pretty sure I could sell you, I could convince you, I could persuade you, I could document to you within the next four minutes that the United States was created of, for, and by the wealthy, right. period. Those who are in power, yeah. Okay. We already know that. It, w- not even for the wealthy citizens. Oh, the wow. wealthy citizens benefit from, from the, the plutocracy right. because they get their wealth from the elements that make up the p- plutocracy. Right. But the nature of the American so-called experiment is a veneer you know, an outward appearance of democracy Mm -hmm. that underneath hides a plutocracy and that it has been a plutocracy from its very inception. So um, idealistically is um, democracy for the people, by the people. However, the real force is those who's in power, those who got the money. You know, you you judge a fruit, you know, by... You know, by, by, by its nature, by, 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 by how it tastes, you know, what's actually inside of the fruit. You don't judge the fruit by something that somebody tells you is across the street. Mm-hmm. You taste the fruit and you know yourself. It's, it's a lemon. It's a pear. It's a peach. You, you know what it is. So when you taste the American democracy, you find out fairly quickly that this is not a democracy that responds to you unless you are a part of the people that have the ability to influence the democracy. And the people who have the ability to influence democracy in a direct sense are the people that have cash. Now, you, as a, if you come together as groups, which is why you see in America so many different uh, collections of people. You have people that protect the interests of animals. Why, I don't know, but the, the pet of people, right? <laughs> They, they they actually come together as a nationwide organization to fight for cats and dogs and ostriches and chimpanzees and so on, right? 
if they didn't have lots of people that join that conversation and say that we collectively have a will to see this sort of thing done in this country, if that's not what takes place, the dogs and the cats and the chickens and whatnot would disappear because the country would just use them as fuel for their their energy fires or something like that. They, they, they just wouldn't care. Look how many, how many creatures, even in the United States, have gone extinct since the United States was formed. Wow, you're right about that. Remember that? Remember there used to be something in this country called buffalo? You know, home, home on the range, you know, the deer and the antelopes, you know, rain and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Well, guess why they don't sing that song anymore? Because the deer and the antelopes ain't there anymore. They're gone, right? I mean, there are a few deer left. There's no buffaloes left, right? Because they, they, they capitalist economy uh, exploited these resources to extinction. Not just exploit the resources, they exploited them to extinction, mm. Okay. So I want to help us understand, over its existence, the United States has established forms and norms projecting a one-man, one-vote majoritarian democracy. So it looks like a democracy in which certain rights are enshrined in the Constitution, right? We have the Bill of Rights and other rights that are spelled out in the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution, and they actually uh, uh, state rights for the people that once those rights have been uh, uh, enshrined, have been uh, uh, adopted by the nation, the 14th Amendment says that you can neither make nor enforce any law that would abridge any right that any individual has, not any right, any uh, uh, privilege or immunity that an individual has under this Constitution. That means once you have that right, it can't be taken away. That's what you believed. Mm -hmm. You were taught that in school. When I talk about this stuff, you all repeat what I say before I say it, because you know the words. You you were raised in these words, but you were raised in a false construct, because if that was true, then the Dobbs versus whoever it was, you know, in the Supreme Court case that just reversed Roe versus Wade, that case would not have gone that way. How could it possibly be that a woman has a right to govern her own body in in 1973 and suddenly in in 2022, she no longer has that right? Mm. Isn't that taking away a right that somebody already has? So once you start down that road, and that wasn't the first time, it used to be that free speech was the speech of human beings. You all know what human beings are, right? Yeah. Uh, We got to keep up. Okay. (laughs) So... Human beings used to be the only possessors of free speech. But in the Citizens United case in 2010, the John Roberts uh, Chief Justice-led Supreme Court ruled that money is speech. Mm. let, let 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 me see if I can make this sense to you. This society is is uh, uh, actually has has a uh, a script that has been bought into by the vast majority of American people who think that this is not a society of the haves and the have nots. Fifty eight percent of Americans in a recent poll, 2019, felt that American society was not a society of the haves and the have nots. Now, I'm not no I don't know who they're talking about. Maybe it's just because I've been raised as an African person. I've always known that the society was a, a society of haves and have nots. I didn't know there were any people who thought that the society was not one of haves, the haves and the have nots. But according to Emily Gushin, uh, Gushkin, uh, writing for the Washington Post in April of 2019, she says that Americans are largely sold on the idea that the American democracy is fair and that uh, their individual roles within the democracy are not structurally limited. Now, I know that that's not true, <laughs> okay? But that's what people believe. Because if the things that are unfair are not happening to you, it's easy for you to think that things are fair. Right. You don't understand fairness. You don't have that feel for what unfairness is until you experience it. Until you find out, oh, oh, my vote doesn't count. Oh, oh, I can't register to vote. Oh, oh, I used to have a polling place, you know, over at, you know, on Donaldson Street, but it's not there anymore. It's not until those things start happening to you 
that it begins to register in your brain that this is not a fair, a fair game, that the game is weighted so that some people have more weight than others, even though they're one individual. She goes on to say the Constitution, with its Bill of Rights, mitigates against the majoritarian democracy because it establishes individual rights that cannot be taken away even by a majority vote of the electorate. That's what we've been raised on. That's what makes us feel secure that no matter how powerful Dow Chemical is or how powerful, you know, some Republican conglomerate is or some Democratic, you know, conglomerate is, no matter how powerful they are, they can't extinguish my rights. I still have the right to vote, the right to speak, the right to my property, you know, the right to uh, uh, due process and all the things that need you know, to, to practice my religion. All those things are still true. Well, they're kind of true. They're kind of true. Mm -hmm. You can practice being an evangelical Christian in the uh, Southern Baptist, you know, white, you know, uh, 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 convention. If you're in the black Baptist convention, so even though you're Baptist, but you're in the black convention, your rights don't have the same texture. They don't, they don't have the same throw weight as the, the throw weight of the people in the white uh, Southern Baptist convention. Uh, Mr. Hill, we got a um, viewer from Facebook who basically says um, that was a great example of how we perceive truth and information. Way cool, man. Very cool, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you being in it with us because that's the only way we're going to get this changed is if we begin to release ourselves to see what is true rather than see what it is that we want to be true. Do you know what that means? See, you can want everybody to be right. If you're a child, you got parents, mm -hmm. you want your parents to be married to each other and in the game for each other, and therefore in the game for you. You don't want your parents to be out here doing a Saturday night drag thing, you know, <laughs> behind everybody's back and whatnot. So you want to believe. Now, you may see, you know, your father's doing something he shouldn't be doing. You may see that, but you try to talk yourself into, no, no, dad's really in the game for me. He's not, he's not trying to pull us, you know, pull us apart. In 1789, the Constitution granted the states the power to define voting rights. That seems reasonable, right? I mean, the Constitution, we just, just created the federal government. So who was going to do the determination of who got the right to vote, what the process was to be able to run for office and so on? Who's going to do that? Well, they gave that to the various states and let them pull all of that stuff together. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Generally, the states restricted the right, however, uh, to vote. They restricted that right to taxpaying or property owning white males. So this place that you say was born, the birthplace of democracy, the American experiment, the American exceptionalism. Right. That's mm -hmm. that thesis that you all have operated from for all these years. But I need for you to know that when the right to vote was finally established in the Constitution adopted in 1789, only white property owning males could vote. They represented 6% of the American population. Mm. How can 6% of the people wow. vote for the other 94% of the people and you call this a majoritarian democracy? I, How can that possibly be? Correct. I get it now. 6%. Yeah. I'm wow. trying to help us now. Okay? So, so they established the plutocracy in 1789. Yeah. My, pastor used to always, my pastor used to always say, how you begin almost always determines how you end. If you start out as a corrupt, venile creature, I don't care how much time goes by, you're just going to become a better, corrupt, venile creature. <laughs> I'm not trying to crap on the United States. I'm just trying to help us understand why this country is following the path that the country is following. Hey, Mr. Hare, I just want to I saw something recently where this white man, he goes, um, he goes, when they came up with the, uh, what's that, the woke movement? Yep. He said a lot of the white women got on board. They kind of, and he was and he was funny because he said, hold up, white women. You was the one that was with us when we did all these vile things and this. Now you want to switch over. No, you you join in. You got to suffer just like we suffered, the, the woke movement. No, 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 no. They, they, they actually got to ride on the back 
of the civil rights movement. Right, yeah, that's right? what he's saying. White women couldn't own property. They couldn't become the directors right. of corporations. That's, that's what they were saying. They yeah. couldn't vote, you know, right. et cetera, et cetera, right. right? So when black folks got together and organized national movements, you know, to create those rights for all— Remember, notice now the rights that, that black people fought for were never rights for black people per se. There's not a single civil rights initiative ever put on paper anywhere that talks about rights just for black people. Wow. Every civil rights document that you see that represents what uh, uh, African people were fighting for talked about rights that everybody ought to have. They always fought for everybody, right. not for somebody. White women got to benefit from that. Right. They didn't go to jail for it. Right. They didn't get hung for it. They didn't get shot for it. Right. They got to benefit from it. Right. But now that they've gotten the benefits, they're saying that, oh, but America is, you know, uh, uh, exceptional and it's a majoritarian experiment. And, you know, we all should get on board and we should not be having all of this antagonism, you know, that you all are are pushing for because you want those rights to hum somehow, you know, become tangible for black and brown and yellow and red, you know, people and so on. That, that's what's really going on right now. See, so remember what I said from the beginning. If something is not happening to you, you have a tendency to have a more cavalier attitude about it. Yeah, it doesn't affect you. So You become less cavalier when you start finding the money came out of your pocket. Right. If it was coming out of Willie's pocket, You'd be sitting up and saying, well, you know, Willie, you know, you, you could do other things. You, you don't have to do what you're doing right now. You, you could do something else. See, until Norm goes into his pocket and finds, I used to have $400 bills in my pocket. I only got $300 bills in my pocket right now. Something happened to one of my $100 bills. All of a sudden, Norm got something to say, right? Yeah. But what I'm saying is as soon as you find out that Willie lost one of the $100 bills that were in his pocket, and he's not the one who lost that hundred dollars, then you should be saying, well, who took the hundred dollars? What do we have to do to see to it that he gets his hundred dollars put back in his pocket? Because if I protect him keeping his hundred dollar in his pocket, I'm by definition protecting me to keep from somebody else coming along and taking a hundred dollars out of my pocket. Right. Now, you all know how I am, right? You take $100 out of my pocket, you should be, pre be prepared to lose your arm, okay? I'm coming to, I'm coming to get my pound of flesh. I'm not waiting on a court, okay? I'm coming to get my pound of flesh. And this is true because, Mr. Hare, if, you, if he feels like he's not getting $100 that you get in, He's going to have a problem, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because because it, it don't take much for me to understand what threatens me. OK, if I see somebody trying to play you, I know good and well, if I let them get away with it, they're going to try to play me, too. So right. I might as well go ahead and fight this battle as soon as I know right. that the battle is joined. Let me join in right now. Why wait? So um, while the founding fathers uh, viewed voting as a basic aspect of democracy, uh, only white male property owners had the, the freedom to vote. Uh, increasingly over time, the freedom to vote was gradually expanded to colonists and or, or former colonists and states, uh, not only to property owners, but to all white men. But even then, with all white men being able to vote, whether they own property or not, they only represented 52 percent of the population. Excuse me, 42 percent of the population. So. I'm talking about all the way up until 1865, from 1776 to 1865, for 90 years, America was a minority-ruled country, by definition. So it's understanding this helps you to understand what's inside of the sort of psychic DNA of America. Yeah. Being a majoritarian, excuse me, being a democratic republic in which everybody had a right to vote and you had rights that were guaranteed to you in writing in the Constitution that protected you from the majority trying to oppress you by taking away your right to speech and property, et cetera, et cetera. For, for, for ha having that, uh, you've been able to have that. All, 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 I lost my train of thought here. But... Understanding that the reality of America has been that it has not been a majoritarian democracy with guaranteed rights 
for everyone, that would be a democratic republic. What America has been is a plutocracy that has the appearance of democracy, right. but it's a republic for those people that have power in this mm -hmm. society. Mr. Hare, <clears throat> it almost seems like um, I'm, I'm kind of understanding how uh, how the have how the haves right now are trying so hard to hold on to what they have. They don't want to see any change because they've they've um, enjoyed this uh, uh, you know what they have for over 200 years. You know, keep in mind that by 1850, 15 years before the end of the Civil War, 1850. America went from being not in, in a country at all, did not even exist, until 1776. It went from 1776 to 1850, literally a 76-year uh, period. In that 76-year period, the United States went from being nobody at all, not even existing, to being the third largest economy on Earth. And what made it the third largest economy on Earth? Cotton. Cotton, yeah. So how did cotton become the engine for the economy of the world? Because it was built on the free labor on the backs, the blood, sweat, and tears of African people, of four and a half million African people at a time. That's what built the cotton industry. That's what turned the American uh, uh, experiment into the third largest economy on earth in a span of 76 years. So if you were the ones who were you know, receiving the, the benefit of that. You ran the railroads, the trucking companies, the, uh, the uh, cotton uh, uh, mills, you know, and so on. You ran the restaurants that serviced those people, and you're making fat money, you know, off of this industry. Are you going to be inclined to want to give that up? Not at all. You hear somebody, Not at all. you hear Willie H. coming along, you know, talking about, well, man, I, I was just up in New England, and, and they had black people that weren't slaves. Uh, can, can, can I not be a slave? What do you think is about to happen to Willie if he started running around here talking like that when people are making that kind of money? That's okay, right. that's that's why y'all didn't meet Willie until now. He couldn't even he couldn't even get on the planet. He was up in heaven trying to get down here on Earth. He couldn't even get on the planet. They said we ain't got no room for you, Willie, because because you don't get it. You don't you don't want to be a slave. You, you you can't you can't be with us, right? See, I mean that that's how that's how insidious you know this this thing is. The, the largest property owners or possessions of wealth in this country have an outsized role or influence over the American democracy. To elect people into offices, people have to have the resources to communicate with the broad masses of people that make up the electorate in a given jurisdiction or uh, election district. They have to be able to leave their jobs or businesses <clears throat> or radically reduce those activities in order to campaign. They have to be able to support their families while they're running for office. They have to be able to support their household economies after they have won elected office. To the greatest extent, only those who have wealth or who can recruit others who have wealth can generally succeed in gaining electoral office. George Santos, you know, the, the newly discovered liar, you know, for the Republican Party, uh, Republican out of Nassau County, he was basically, you know, I don't want to say he's a nobody, he's just, you know, a regular guy. You know, he's making fifty-five, sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Apparently couldn't pay his bills in New York. They threw him out of his apartment, you know, a couple of years ago, him and his sister, uh, which apparently they were able to keep four four dogs and they destroyed the apartment and whatnot. But that's another story altogether. But he was able to go from nothing in that two two years ago to somehow being able to have enough money thrown his way by uh, wealthy donors that he was able to uh, write a check to himself, excuse me, to his campaign of six hundred dollars or $700,000. Mm. How does a guy who hasn't made more than fifty dollars or $60,000 a year three years ago, two years ago, able was able to be able to write a check to his campaign uh, a committee of $700,000. Where'd he get that $700,000 from? Wealthy people invested in him to enable him to run for office, and he succeeded in winning that office. He beat Tom Suozzi, you know, for that office, you know, in New York City, and uh, uh, turned himself into a love child of the Republican Party. Now they're finding out this guy's a complete skunk and so on, but you, if, if money is the, the determiner 
of who who wins and who do, who, who loses, lots of skunks are going to get uh, uh, attracted to that money. So listen, we got to take a quick break and talk to our sponsors. Hopefully, we're making some kind of sense to you. Look forward to talking on this side of the break here at Living for the People at ninety one point three FM. FM. <laughs> Excuse me, FM WBNY. <laughs> Some people won't give you the real talk on drugs, but it's time we know the facts. Fentanyl is often laced into illicit drugs and used to make fake versions of prescription pills. You can't see it, taste it, or smell it. Suppliers mix fentanyl into their products because it's potent and cheap, and the dealer might not even know. Keep yourself and others safe by knowing the real deal on fentanyl. Get the facts. Go to realdealonfentanyl.com. This message is brought to you by the Ad Council. To protect his home and family from disaster, Steve used courage, wisdom, and his camera phone. That should do it. Way to go, Steve! By simply taking digital pictures of his family's important documents, Steve can always have them stored safely online, no matter when disaster strikes. Learn other simple ways to protect your home and family before a natural disaster at ready.gov. That's ready.gov. A message from FEMA and the Ad Council. Tune in 91.3 FM WBNY Mondays 6 p.m. for Mental Health Versus, where Carl Shallowhorn mashes up music and mental health in a way you've never heard before. Carl dives into topics such as trauma, depression, and anxiety with compelling guests and captivating music. Mental Health Versus, a show both entertaining and informative. Check out Mental Health Versus Mondays at 6 p.m. on 91.3 FM WBNY. All right, welcome back to Living for the People. This is L. Nathan Hare. Welcome you again. We're talking about a concept, the idea that America is a democracy and that the democracy is being threatened by some of the decisions that have been, been made and practices that have been adopted uh, in this country. And what I guess I'm trying to help us to understand is if you plant a seed from a cactus plant, that seed is not going to grow up into being a peach tree. It's going to grow up to be a cactus plant. If you see something is growing up to be a cactus plant, you know that it didn't come from a peach tree seed. It came from a cactus seed. When you look at America and you see that America is transforming openly into a plutocracy in which the fattest of the fat cats are able to rule over everybody else, the Cooks uh, are brothers, you know, the, uh, uh, the Waltons, you know, the Thiels, you know, the uh, 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 Mark Zuckerbergs, you know, all these super billion people are able to rule over the rest of us. And you ask yourself, how has this happened? You know, what, what happened to our democracy? The seeds that you see that, that, or, or the democracy, the fruit of the democracy that you see in front of you right now, that fruit came from the seed that was planted in 1776, in 1789. That seed shows you what really was planted. It was not a, 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 a majoritarian uh, a democratic republic in the first place. It was always a plutocracy. They just hid the plutocracy so that you couldn't see it so easily. They actually uh, initially told you it was a plutocracy. Six percent of the population could vote in 1789. Six percent. I'm pretty sure you could figure out that does not mean you're in a majoritarian democracy. But you accepted it because you were trying to free yourself from England. So uh, as long as you could you could uh, uh, blunt the, the, the gunfire coming from the English and their swords and, you know, and their other, you know, armaments and so on, you were OK with that. And you were willing to accept whatever you got to accept in order to get to that space. As the United States got further and further away from being controlled by the English, what? the United States became uh, uh, less dependent on uh, 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 the, the structures that were developed to, to fight against the English. And therefore, the um, uh, democracy took on more of a democratic veneer, uh, right? Do we have a caller hanging on? We got a caller. Is that Joshua's voice that I heard? Good morning, Mr. Hare. How are you doing? All right, Joshua. How are you doing? Good. So you're saying... You know, I mean, if we look at our Constitution, we still have amendments. It's still a growing 
piece of legislation, in, in a sense, it, it's still alive. We can still change things about, about it. Well, that's true. You know, and if I had a hammer, I'd, I'd hammer in the morning. <laughs> and I, I'd hammer in the You're evening. You're killing me! All, 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 all over the land. But the I, 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 I'd hammer about danger. <laughs> but the point being is that the country may have started one way, but the document itself is ever-changing. It's true that the document is ever-changing. What I'm trying to help us to understand is that it's changing into more of what it originally was. See, what, what, what we're missing is because this country was already a plutocracy, that the democracy was something that was being done to make it appear to be something other than what it was. So you've seen all these amendments, you know, that provided these guarantees of rights and immunities and privileges and so on. But right. over the course of time, what we're seeing is that those rights, privileges and immunities are being eroded. They're not being added to. They're being eroded. When, you, when Roe versus Wade was adopted, it created a litmus test or an experiment right. that you could look at and say, right. here's where this country really is. Because right. prior to the adoption of Roe versus Wade, there was no right established in law where a woman could terminate the pregnancy of or, or, or the life of her unborn child, that right. she could do that based on her own discretion. That right. did not exist. When that was uh, 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 adopted in the 1973 Roe versus Wade decision, right. that that gave a right to women that right. prior to that moment did not exist. Right. But in this year, in the excuse me, in the year that just passed in 2022, the Judge Roberts Court has determined right. that a right. woman really did not have that right and has taken that right away. So we. But that's done, because people voted. For a president that put in different Supreme Court members, but that was done legally by that president. But, but we're not saying it wasn't done legally. What I'm saying okay. is that so it, doesn't that, that reflect how the people at that time felt? What I'm saying, what, what, what I'm saying is that uh, this was it wasn't it was done illegally. It was done legally. That's not the yeah. issue, and the well, issue isn't the what the people wanted. The vast majority of American people, more than 71 percent of the American people in every poll taken around the country, That's said true. that a woman had a right to vote. So right. it was not the people's decision, a Democratic decision that determined whether or not women had the right not to vote, but to uh, 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 to, to, to govern her body. Right. It, 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 it was not what the people wanted. It's what certain ideological people that got placed that on the Supreme true. Court, what that, they wanted. But the that's true, but it was still lawfully done. But, I, but I never argued that it was unlawful. I didn't say it was unlawful. I'm saying that the country is transforming more right. and more back into what the country was, was originally. This was a country of, by, and for the wealthy. It was created for their, for their needs. That's why the only people that could vote at all in 1789 were 6% right. of the people of the country. 94% right. of the people in this country could not vote at all. Over the right. course of time, voting right. rights have been expanded, so right. now it's more like 94% of the people can vote and right. only 6% can't vote. But right. who do you get to vote for? How do you actually get a person into a position where they could vote for you or you could campaign for them? That requires money. And if you right. don't have money to be right. able to uh, run your campaign to allow yourself to be able to stop working, stop running your business, and spend right. your time campaigning. If you don't have the ability to do that, you can't be a candidate to represent the people. And That's if you have true. to go to if you, if you have to go to people that have money in order to get the money to campaign, right. then right. by definition, your ears are going to be more tuned to the interests of those people that gave you the money than they're right. going to be to the interests of the people who could only buy so, a chicken dinner you know, for $10 to support your campaign. <laughs> See, so so we have to understand this reality. If we're going to change this, see, see, sometimes we don't understand, it's, it's not that we don't understand the problem, we just don't understand what to do to solve the problem, so we huh. accept our rationale for why we don't solve the problem. What I'm suggesting is if you look at this situation like many other countries do, and you say, if you're going to run for office, you meet a certain lit litmus test in terms of stability, morality, uh, uh, stable e economics for yourself and your family, then we will give you public money. 
and you use the public money and the caps that are placed on advertising, et cetera, et cetera, with public money, we will give you Other that. countries do that? There are many countries that do that right now. This is not new. Most of the things that need to be done in the world to solve problems, the solutions to solve those problems already exist in the world. You know, it's not that it's not Nate Hare inventing stuff. You, right. you just need to go look at other people that had the problem and solve well, the problem and well, then Mr. try Hare, to adopt so what they do. In the world that people don't even have the right to vote. But that's not the, the, the issue isn't whether or not there's somebody else that's worse off than us. That's well, I'm not aspiring to be, you know, as low as but, somebody else is. I'm aspiring to be the best that I can be. So to be the best that I can be, I've got to somehow liberate myself from being a country that is ruled by dollars. This country's Supreme Court, they should even take the word Supreme off the name of this country, uh, of this court. This country's Supreme Court ruled, and I'm not making this up, it's actually in the text of the ruling. This country ruled that money is speech. How can money be speech? Money is just money. Corporations are just corporations. Corporations aren't people. But you had a president of the United States actually say to your face in front of you with a straight face told you that corporations are people. Mitt Romney said that to you and you didn't even respond. He said that to you and you said, well, you know, that's that's within the range of opinions that people can have. That's not in the range of, of, of people's opinions. That's insane. Corporations are not people. Money is not speech. If Mitt you Romney were, was also the only Republican that stood up when Ketanji Brown was okay. We're, we're not people. arguing, is there ever been a time when Mitt Romney has said something that was true? We, 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 we do expect that, you know, a broke clock keeps correct time twice a day. So that, that's not the issue. The issue is, it. you know, we, we, we end up, you know, having these, these arguments you know, trying, we well, almost trivialize what it is that we're, we're, we're talking about. Mr. Hare, I definitely, I would never do that. I'm just taking, I, I'm looking at what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying, but I'm also saying, hey, you know what? This country can make some successful changes as well. I'm not saying we're perfect. Lord knows we're not. I get that. But at least we have a moving, living document like the Constitution with amendments that Hopefully, can change things for the better. And Mr. Hare, I, Mr. Hare, I got to agree with him. There have been some changes, although it seems like we're going back. But there have been some changes. Also, we got another caller. Caller? I'll let you go. Thank you, Mr. Hare. All right. Bye. Thank you, Joshua. All right. We got another caller. Hi, caller. caller. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How you doing? I'm doing pretty wonderful. How about yourself? I'm Happy doing great. Year. Happy Kwanzaa. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Happy holidays. Um, so, I think that. You know, the League of Women Voters, I'm going to give a shameless plug. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. We are, we are free to do that. <laughs> because, you know, we've been calling out gerrymandering and redistricting. And these are other insidious ways that we are yep. losing our democracy. And we've been against the Electoral College for well over 25 years. Yep. So I'm encouraging your viewers just to look at where we stand for the League of Women Voters because we've had – I mean, this is – it's just getting – worse and worse. And here in Pennsylvania, for instance, there was a Republican woman. She was a music teacher, and she did a redistricting map because she saw how unfairly the, the districts were drawn, in, were drawn in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania said, this is reasonable. This looks good. And then in the 11th hour, it got shot down. Okay, yep. So, you know, it has to be nonpartisan. And I look at Georgia, where the governor there, I mean, the first time he ran, I do believe in my heart and heart the first time that Stacey Abrams really would have won. But he disenfranchised so many, so many people, voters. And when you listen to well-informed shows on NPR or probably even on your show, how he systematically went about disenfranchising thousands and thousands of voters, you know, it's like he stole it. And he was at the, the other insidious part is, what was he, the secretary of state at the time? Right. Right. So he had the power to do that. Yep. So it's it's even beyond whether it's legal or not. I mean, I do believe that there are many illegal things happening. Um, and it, it, you know, right to... now, the Republican Party, they are the I call them and for, forgive me, but I call them the party of by any means necessary. And that's exactly they're... what they are. It, it, it should be understood that 
something does not have to be illegal to be wrong. It used to be that if you have a conflict of interest, a apparent conflict of interest, even if it was not uh, illegal, you would still withdraw yourself from an action in which you have a fundamental apparent conflict of interest for the sake of the public that has to believe in the integrity of your decisions, that that's, exactly. what, that's what you would do. But exactly. that, that's no longer the case now. Right. Now, the Republicans say, well, if you don't have a law that you can point to that says that I can't do something, then I'm going to do it. So if the law says that you have to bring the Electoral College votes from the states to a, uh, a, a, a an Electoral College convention and then go from the convention to the uh, joint session of Congress and those same delegates have to be presented to the joint uh, session of Congress, if that's what has to happen, and you say, was well, there any law that says that I have to bring that particular set of, of uh, slate of delegates to the joint session of Congress? Could I substitute somebody else, you know, to be the representatives for, for, uh, from the Electoral College for that state? And since there was no law that explicitly said you couldn't do that, the Republicans said, well, then we, you know, we should, even though the entire state had voted for this slate of Electoral College delegates. The Republicans say, well, there's nothing that says we have to do that, so we're yeah. not going to do it. We're going to do something yeah. else. See, so it, the, the problem here is that w we have a system that largely depends on integrity, on honor, uh, 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 that, that, that we just from custom, we, we've, we've created a system of shifting the government from one administration to a subsequent administration without violence. We, that's been the system that we've, we've created, but it's been created based on custom, based on honor, based on norms that were established. But if you have, have somebody who's abnormal, who has no honor, has no honesty, they can manipulate you. <laughs> so you're, you're talking about um, Clarence Thomas not refusing himself for some of the upcoming— Now we're talking. Now we're yeah, talking. That's what you're I talking mean, about. The there mere no fact honor. that so many people in this country, me being one of them, so many people in this country suspect any decision that Clarence Thomas made that has to do with the transfer of power in the election or the things that were done to put people in a position to influence the, the, the transfer of power, the, 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 any decision that he made, I'm going to be suspicious of because he's in bed with his wife and his wife is out here 35, 40 times you know, calling Mark Meadows up saying, you know, we yeah. got to stop this thing. You know, this can't yeah. be done. No. What are you talking about? We had a legitimate election. Y your own Republican, you know, uh, 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 computer chief, whatever they call that person, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Craig or Kreps, whatever his name was. You, you got your own appointee who says this was the best run election in the history of elections in the United States. And yet you still have her running around here saying that the election was stolen, et cetera, et cetera. And you're in bed with this woman every single day, and you want me to believe that y'all didn't talk? You well, didn't have any conversation about this? What's very scary is what's on their docket for this year. There's some important decision that has to do giving states rights. Yep. The I can't remember the name of it now, but the ability to throw out who are going to be their electoral college appointees and— you know, right. even or they, that they, that the major that the government, local governments, can decide. I mean, Clarence Thomas right. actually voted. His vote didn't didn't uh, gain a majority, but he actually voted uh, to accept the idea that mixed uh, mixed race marriages were unconstitutional. Yeah. yeah. Even though he's in a mixed race marriage, yeah. which is yeah. crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So crazy. so how can you have any confidence? in anything that comes out of his mouth. It's not illegal for him to vote the way, the way he voted, but the, the conflict of interest is so manifestly apparent that a law should have been passed to stop him from doing what he was doing. Yeah, and John Roberts needs to... Right. He needs to step it up, but yep. you know, this is just not a good Supreme Court. Well, I really enjoy, you know, I think we are, we're on a very, we're beyond a slippery slope. And we are losing our democracy, yep. and there are people in, who supposedly got elected who used really insidious means to get there, and it's scary, you know. So, you know, we've just got to fight harder. And it just uh, thank you for all your information. I really treasure it.
Thank hey, you so much. Hey, for by the way, by Thanks. the way, um, I saw um, Stacey Abram, Abram, Abram. She's some um, New Frontier, boldly going where no man has gone before. She was on Star Trek, y'all. I saw that. You saw that? <laughs> I, I was blown that. away when I saw. And it. And the thing that was so funny is she wasn't acting. She was just playing out. You know, That's what I'm saying. This, she's this in the new where, frontier. She said, this is where I'm at. I mean, <laughs> this is where I belong. You know, you know, she, you know I think, what, what, did he, what did he do? He, I think he gave a handout to the teachers' union right. in order to co-opt their vote. I mean, there's just so much stuff that, you know, he did to win the last election. And it's, you know, media has some bad influence, I hate to say. Absolutely. Not you guys. You guys are wonderful. Yeah, but, you but, know, but we have a lot of people in the media that are co-conspirators in this thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Keep on shining, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Happy New Year. Okay, bye-bye. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. So there are basically two tracks that this country is moving on. The first is the track of a majoritarian democracy with guaranteed rights, uh, with voting and other rights protected by the Constitution, in which most, if not all, citizens can exercise those rights. We know that not everybody can exercise every right, so we're not arguing that issue. But most people in the current format of the country have rights that they can exercise. They can actually use the rights that, that belong to them. The second track is the one that operates behind the scenes of the American uh, view, uh, uh, point of or, or view, uh, the lens that we're able to see through. It's, it's a plutocracy in which those individuals and corporate entities with wealth are able to exercise outsized influence over the governance uh, of America. It, is simply, it simply cannot be denied that the plutocracy has gained the openly upper hand in which money is the dominant feature of the American democracy. That cannot be denied. If you don't have one or two billionaires, you know, that are willing to allow you to get in there, they always say, you know, the, in your pocket. That's not true. That's one or two billionaires that will put you in their pocket. If you don't have a couple of those going on, you can't run for a national office at all. Uh, if you're running for a statewide office, you probably need somebody who's at least half a billionaire that's willing to allow you to live in their pocket, you know, for you to have enough money for you to be able to run, you wow. know, these campaigns. And, of course, the media lives off of advertising. We spent something like $2 billion on advertising alone. What is advertising? You know, between this 30 seconds and this 30 seconds, you get to give me $20 million, you know, to get your message across. Yep. The only work you got to do is the work that Willie does. Turn this on, turn this off, turn this on, turn this off. Right? Am I making that up? Uh, you're right. You're okay. right. So you're right on. Right so on. getting back to the roots of democracy, back to Cass uh, uh, Harrison's uh, thought that, that generated this discussion, in a democracy, the masses broadly def- uh, determine their future. In a democracy, as Joshua was saying, uh, each individual has one vote, uh, uh, so to speak, meaning that each person has equal say and equal influence over their government. In the purest terms, the U.S. citizens still enjoy one vote per person. But in functional terms, the say or influence a a U.S. citizen has over their government equates to their income level. And the result is that the interests reflected by the American people in poll after poll are neglected or ignored, while the interests of the wealthy individuals and corporation, corporations are continuously nourished. Has America strayed from democracy? Well, today, when working class or even middle class uh, Americans have to compete with the affluent elites, they are not competing on a level playing field. According to Kishore uh, 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 Mabubani, uh, who wrote, they have to run uphill to score goals. By contrast, the affluent elites run downhill as the playing field is tilted in their favor. Another journalist, uh, Garita Harris, uh, 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 Anand Garita, Har- 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 Garita Harad- Haradas, these names are hard to say, addressed the issue in his timely book, Winners Take All. Quoting him, he says, a successful society is a progress machine. I think it's an important context. A successful society is a progress machine. It takes in the raw materials of innovation and produces broad human advancement. The American machine is broken. He says when the fruits of of, of change have fallen on the United States in recent decades, the very fortunate have basketed almost all of the fruits of change. He listed several examples. He says the income levels, feel this now, 
The income of the top 10 percent of Americans has doubled, more than doubled, since 1980. However, the income level of the top 1 percent of this country since 1990 has tripled over that time period. Oh, I'm not done. I'm not done. The income level of the top one, how's it, one, one one thousandth of a percent. So 0.001 percent. The income level of that one one thousandth percent has increased 700 percent, sevenfold Ooh. over the course of the last 30 years. The income for the bottom half of Americans which are half of the country's entire population, has not moved one inch mm. over the last 30 years. Wow. You need to understand what's happening in your country, okay? Mm. These familiar figures amount to three and a half decades worth of wondrous head-spinning change with zero impact on the average pay of 117 million Americans who have not seen a change in their pay at all. Wow. Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz wrote in uh, Vanity Fair in 2011. He says of the uh, 1 percent, he says of the 1 percent, by the 1 percent, for the 1 percent, which made a similar assessment, noting that the top 1 percent of Americans are raking up about a quarter of America's income every year. With respect to wealth, the top 1 percent control 40 percent of all of the wealth in this country. Just a quarter century ago, 25 years ago, the top 1% raked in just 12% of the nation's income and controlled just 33% of the nation's wealth. So you can see who the country has been running for over the course of this. We, we can measure this. This is not something that we're making up. We're, you can measure this. You can see what's actually been going on. So if we're going to do something about it, we better first recognize what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. And if we won't tell ourselves the truth, about what is actually taking place and what the barometers are that tell you how to measure what's been taking place, you won't have in you something that you can use to focus on to drive yourself towards those things that need to be changed to turn those realities around. So the rich gets the rich prosper and the the poor just main just, minimal maintain. Just, just amble along. Yeah. He says eventually these inequalities will enable those who are better situated to exercise a larger influence over the development of legislation. Obviously, what Mabubani describes has already been happening for decades. Zuckerberg, Koch, Sergey Brin, Jeff Bezos, all have outsized political influence. In principle, their outsized political influence is a problem. It violates the basic tenets of democracy. In practice, their outside political influence is used, above all things, to preserve and augment their own personal wealth, which is, of course, at the expense of the majority's wealth and self-interest. I know I'm speaking generally about the elite and their interests and their political ambitions, but for the most part, uh, the point stands. Jim Walton's political interests cut against the political interests, and Jim Walton has a significantly higher ability to exert his political interests than you have of, ex of ex exerting your political interests. I wanted to talk to you all, we'll talk about it on Wednesday, uh, a party with no morality. Thank you all for listening to us and supporting us. It was a lively conversation today. Look forward to talking to you all on Wednesday here at Living for the People at 91.3 FM, WBNY. See you all then. Over here. Hi, do you want to be interviewed about the holidays? Hello, I love your pigtails. Never change. I love your hair as well. Hello. Do you want to be interviewed about the holidays? What holidays do you celebrate? <laughs> Give me the mic first. <laughs> what holidays do you celebrate? <laughs>